this study unit is devoted to processor organization. As we will see, the processor is the principal element in any PDP-11 system. In an earlier study unit, we mentioned that there are different types of PDP-11 processors, small, medium, and large. This classification is based on performance factors, such as the size of the instruction set, the speed with which these instructions are executed, and the maximum number of memory locations that can be addressed. Although our PDP-11 processors differ in terms of their performance factors, they do have much in common. For instance, they are all 16-bit machines. These PDP-11 processors can operate on a full word or on just a high byte or on just a low byte. The PDP-11 processors also have a similar architecture. Finally, all PDP-11 processors execute the same basic set of instructions. Of course, additional instructions are available in the medium and larger systems, but all PDP-11 processors share a large and powerful set of instructions. Now that we have reviewed some basic points, let's see what will be covered in this study unit. We'll begin this study unit by taking an overall look at how the PDP-11 processor is organized. Then we'll explain processor operations in terms of three major functional elements, the Unibus control, the data manipulation logic, and the general purpose registers. Finally, we'll explain the purpose and format of the processor status word and show you how this status word affects processor operation. Let's start out with a brief overview of the three major elements that make up any PDP-11 processor. One of these elements is called the Unibus Control, or UC. The Unibus Control handles communications between the processor and external devices. It also contains the priority arbitration logic that determines which device is to become the next bus master. The second major processor element is a set of general purpose registers, or GPRs. These registers provide internal storage and allow the processor to perform many operations without having to tie up the Unibus. We can store information in these GPRs, manipulate it, and retrieve it in much the same manner as core memory locations. The third major element in the processor is the data manipulation logic, or DM. The DM has a number of jobs, such as performing arithmetic and logical operations, decoding instructions, and controlling information flow into and out of the GPRs. Now, let's see how these three major elements interact. Information flow through the processor is in the form of a figure eight. As you can see, the Unibus control routes data from the bus to the data manipulation logic for modification, and then to the GPRs for storage or data from the GPRs can be modified by the data manipulation logic and then routed to the bus by the Unibus control. In this study unit, we will further break down the data manipulation logic into four functional blocks. The bus address register, or BAR, does just what its name implies. It provides temporary storage for all bus addresses used by the processor. Our next element, the buffer register, or BR, serves as a temporary holding area for data. Thus, data entering the processor and data leaving the processor passes through this BR. The instruction register, or IR, is the third element in the DM. All instructions fetched from memory are held in this instruction register, where they are available for decoding. The fourth and final element is this arithmetic and logic unit, or ALU. The ALU is the only element in the processor that can manipulate operands to form a result. For example, it can increment a value or add two values together, or take a value and complement it. 
In all cases, the task performed by the ALU is determined by the instruction that has been decoded in the IR. In order to perform an instruction, the processor must step through a certain sequence of operations. The first step is to get the instruction from memory, or, as we say, to fetch the instruction. The next step is to get the operand or operands. In other words, the processor must obtain the data that the instruction is to act upon. We call this data an operand. This data may be stored externally in memory or in an I.O. device register, or the data may be stored internally in one of the processor's general purpose registers. Once the processor has obtained the necessary operands, it can execute the instruction and store the result. That is, it performs the job specified by the instruction, such as add two operands, increment a register, or branch to a new point in the program. After the instruction has been executed, the processor must service any interrupts or traps that are pending. Remember what we said about interrupts? They can be serviced between instruction cycles. Now, let's look at the steps of an instruction cycle in more detail. The first step in any instruction cycle is for the processor to retrieve or fetch the instruction. In all PDP-11 systems, a program counter, or PC, is used to hold the address of the next instruction to be fetched. This PC is one of our general purpose registers. Therefore, when the processor is ready for another instruction, it obtains the address of the next instruction from the PC and loads the instruction address into its bus address register, or BAR. The Unibus control then takes over by placing the address of the instruction on the bus address lines. It then retrieves the instruction from memory by performing a data I bus cycle. Once the Unibus control has retrieved the new instruction from memory, it loads it into the instruction register, or IR. The processor can now decode the new instructions stored in the IR to find out what job it is to perform. Before proceeding any further with the instruction, the processor also increments the PC by two. The PC now contains an address that points to the next instruction word in the program. The PC is incremented by two because each instruction is a full word, not a byte. At this point, the fetch operation is complete. Now the processor can retrieve the operand or operands specified by the decoded instruction. If the operand is stored in one of the general purpose registers, no further operations are required to obtain the operand. Remember, data stored in the GPR is internal to the processor. No bus cycle is required. Therefore, the processor can go directly to the execute operation. What happens if the operand is stored externally in some bus device? For example, here, the operand address is stored in a GPR. This means that the operand itself is stored outside of the processor in some external location, such as memory or an I.O. device register. Therefore, before executing the instruction, the processor must retrieve this operand by performing a data I bus cycle. Let's examine this operation in a little more detail. Before executing the bus cycle, the processor takes the operand address from one of its GPRs and loads it into the bus address register, or BAR. The Unibus control then places this operand address on the bus and initiates a data I bus cycle to retrieve the operand. The addressed bus device responds by placing the operand on the bus. The Unibus control then loads this operand into the processor's buffer register, or BR. Here's another example of an external operand. In this case, the GPR contains a pointer to the operand's address. This address may be located in memory or in an I.O. device register. Therefore, the processor must first retrieve this address by performing a data I bus cycle. Once the processor has the address, it can retrieve the operand itself by performing a second data I bus cycle. Thus, in this example, Two data I bus cycles are needed to obtain the operand. 
The first cycle retrieves the operand's address. The second cycle retrieves the actual operand. In this fourth and final example, the GPR contains a base address. Before retrieving the operand, the processor must first use this base address to calculate the actual or effective address of the operand. For instance, the processor may add a value to this base address, or it may simply increment the base address. Once the actual address is calculated, the processor uses it to retrieve the operand from memory or from an I.O. register. Once the operand or operands have been retrieved and stored in the processor, the current instruction can be executed. The arithmetic and logic unit, or ALU, executes the instruction. It may perform an arithmetic operation, such as add two operands, or a logical operation, such as complement the operand. Regardless of the operation performed by the ALU, the result must be stored. As you can see here, the result can be stored internally. In other words, it can be stored in one of the processor's general purpose registers. Or the result of the execute operation can be stored externally, that is, in some bus device, such as memory or an I.O. register. When the result is stored externally, the Unibus control, or UC, places the address of the storage device on the Unibus and specifies the type of transfer, either a data O or a data OB. The UC then takes the result stored in the BR and places it on the bus data lines. Now that the instruction has been executed, the processor must service any pending interrupts or traps. If no interrupts or traps are pending, the CPU can immediately fetch the next instruction and go through another instruction cycle. However, if an interrupt or trap is present, the CPU must service it by stepping through a service routine. When the service routine is completed, the processor can return to the main program and fetch the next instruction. Let's see how the service routine is retrieved from memory. Remember our interrupt vector? When a device interrupts the processor, it supplies the CPU with the address of an interrupt vector. The interrupt vector, in turn, contains the starting address of the service routine. The processor first retrieves the starting address from memory. The starting address, in turn, directs the processor to the first instruction in the service routine. In this example, the interrupt vector is stored in memory location 210. As you can see, the contents of memory location 210 is 027400, which is the starting address of the service routine. The processor now steps through the routine in order to service the interrupt. Note that the last instruction in the service routine is stored in location 027414. This instruction returns the processor to the main program. Let's briefly summarize a typical instruction cycle. The processor first fetches and decodes the instruction. Next, it retrieves all operands associated with the decoded instruction. The processor then executes the instruction and stores the result, either internally or externally. After the instruction cycle is completed, the processor services any pending interrupts or traps before going on to the next instruction cycle. The operations just described can be broken down into these four ROM states. Fetch, source, destination, and execute. Note that there are two ROM states for retrieving operands, source and destination. Only the destination state is used if an instruction calls for a single external operand. Both the source and destination states are required if an instruction specifies two external operands. Why do we refer to these operations as ROM states? They're called ROM states because processor operation is controlled by a read-only memory, or a ROM. A microprogram hardwired into this ROM supplies timing signals required for each PDP-11 instruction. This microprogram ROM is not an external memory unit. It's actually built right into the processor. A ROM is used in all PDP-11 processors except the 1115 and 1120. 
Timing signals in the 1115 and 1120 are derived from flip-flops in place of the ROM. An instruction may use as few as two ROM states or as many as four ROM states. Let's step through this ROM flow diagram using some typical PDP-11 instructions. Assume the processor has completed the first ROM state, fetch, and that a clear instruction has been decoded. In this case, we're clearing the contents of a GPR. The operand is internal to the processor, so we exit from the fetch state and go directly to the execute state to clear the general purpose register. Once the clear instruction is executed, we can service any pending interrupts or traps. If there are no interrupts or traps pending, we fetch the next instruction in the program. Note that this clear instruction requires only two ROM states, fetch and execute. In this example, the processor has retrieved an increment instruction. The value to be incremented is stored in an I.O. register. This time the operand is external to the processor, so we must first branch in order to retrieve the operand. In our example, there is no source operand. The I.O. register is treated as the destination. Therefore, we branch directly to the destination state. Once the destination operand is retrieved, we proceed to the execute state and increment the operand. This instruction has used three ROM states, fetch, destination, and execute. Now the processor has been instructed to add the value in a memory location to the value in an I.O. device register. In this case, both operands are external to the processor. Neither one is stored in a GPR. Therefore, we must first branch to the source state to get the operand from memory. Then we must branch to the destination state to get the second operand from the I.O. register. Once the source and destination operands are retrieved, we can proceed to the execute state. This particular add instruction uses all four ROM states, fetch, source, destination, and execute. To summarize, any instruction involves two, three, or four ROM states. The number of states used by an instruction depends on where the operands are located as well as what the instruction is. For instance, here you see an add instruction using all four ROM states. The source operand is located in memory. The destination operand is stored in an I.O. register. Consequently, both the source and destination states are required in order to bring the corresponding operands into the processor. If the two numbers being added were both stored internally in the GPRs, we would not need the source and destination states. In that case, the add instruction would use just two rather than four ROM states. Here we see some typical bus cycles used with each of the four ROM states. The fetch state always requires a data I bus cycle to retrieve the instruction from memory. The source and destination states require one or more data I cycles to retrieve the operand if it is stored in memory or an IO device register. The execute state uses a data O cycle if the result is to be stored externally. No bus cycle is needed if the result is stored internally in the GPRs. That completes our overview of the PDP-11 processor. Now let's take a closer look at the major elements that make up the processor. We'll begin by describing the Unibus control. The Unibus control, or UC, handles all address, control, and data flow between the processor and the devices that are connected to the Unibus. Remember the priority arbitration logic that we described in the previous study unit? Well, it is also located in the Unibus control and handles all bus requests and corresponding bus grants. Let's see how the Unibus control functions during a typical data transaction involving the processor. During a data transaction, the Unibus control selects a slave device by placing its address on the bus and specifies the type of data transfer by asserting or clearing the C0 and C1 lines. The Unibus control also generates master sync, or MSYN signal, to tell the device that it wants to send or receive data. 
The slave device acknowledges the MSYN signal from the Unibus control by returning a slave sync, or SSYN signal. During this interlock dialogue, data is either strobed into the Unibus control or is transferred out to the slave device. Now, let's see how the Unibus control functions when a device interrupt occurs. When a device interrupts the processor, the Unibus control receives the interrupt signal and vector address from the I.O. device. The Unibus control then responds to the interrupt by issuing a slave sync signal, or SSYN, to inform the device that its interrupt vector has been accepted. We've seen how the Unibus control functions during data transactions and interrupts. The Unibus control also plays a major role in handling traps. Before we go any further, let's first define just what a trap is. A trap is similar to an interrupt. It causes the CPU to exit from its main program and jump to a predetermined memory location containing a trap vector. This trap vector supplies the CPU with the starting address of an error routine. The processor then executes this routine before returning to the main program. Interrupts are initiated by external devices. Traps are not. Traps are initiated by hardware contained in the CPU. This hardware is designed to detect certain predetermined conditions, such as power fail, timeout, or illegal instructions. Whenever one of these conditions is detected, the Unibus control is alerted so that the processor can execute an error routine associated with the error condition. The Unibus control responds to the trap by placing the address of a trap vector on the bus address lines. Remember, this vector contains the starting address of the error handling routine. The Unibus control then initiates a data I transfer to retrieve this starting address. The Unibus control completes the data I transfer by strobing in the starting address of the error handling routine. It then routes this address to the program counter by way of the bus address register, or BAR. Now that the starting address has been loaded, the processor is ready to retrieve and execute the first instruction in the error handling routine. The processor executes the error handling routine just like any other program. First, the starting address of the routine is taken from the program counter and is stored in the BAR. The UC then places this starting address on the bus and performs a data I transfer to retrieve the first instruction in the error handling routine. The Unibus control transfers the first instruction in the routine to the instruction register, or IR. The instruction is then decoded and executed by the ALU. While the first instruction is being retrieved, the ALU updates the program counter by two, so it points to the next instruction word in the routine. This process is then repeated for each instruction in the error handling routine. Finally, when all instructions in the routine are executed, the processor exits from the error routine and returns to its main program. These are the signals used by the Unibus control during trap handling. The Unibus control places the address of a trap vector on the bus. This trap vector contains the starting address of a trap handling routine. The Unibus control also clears the C0 and C1 lines to specify a data I transfer and asserts master sync. When the memory places the starting address of the trap handling routine on the bus data lines, it asserts slave sync so that the Unibus control can strobe in the starting address, thus completing the transfer. That wraps up our discussion of the Unibus control, so let's look at the next major processor element. The data manipulation logic is the second of our three major processor elements and performs three prime functions. The first function of the data manipulation logic is to decode all instructions in order to find out what operation the processor is to perform. The decoded instruction also tells the DM where the operands are located, as well as where to store the result once the instruction is executed. The second job of the DM logic is to perform the required arithmetic operations, such as add or increment, and the required logical operations, such as complement or logical ending and oring. Finally, the DM coordinates all activities within the processor. 
The DM logic is responsible for routing information to and from the GPRs and Unibus control. It's about time for a short break. When you return, we'll cover the general purpose registers.